to episode 11 of Top of Mind with Concilia Wealth. We are back once again. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about demystifying mutual fund investing. So we're going to cover capital gains distributions, which is a, a big thing that, that we're navigating right now for clients, uh, cost of funds, and do mutual funds actually beat their benchmarks? Um, before we get there, I want to turn it over to Hal for an update of Market Vitals. Hal, what's going on right now? Thanks, Chris. I think uh, what isn't going on, right? We are just finishing the holiday rush or Black Friday. This is uh, November 29th at 1030 Pacific time. And we got some pretty promising data about how much people are spending. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing in this economy, but yeah. Does that lead to inflation or not? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, The amount of uh, initial sales data coming through is pretty high. And um, we're showing quite a bit of growth year over year. And I think maybe that makes sense. Um, Things might be cheaper uh, in terms of TVs and air fryers, especially. I've never seen so many air fryers on sale. And there weren't as many last year. And maybe that could be the cause of it where where the availability of things was so limited that people had money to spend, even though inflation wasn't really as bad late last year in 2021, maybe, maybe there's just more stuff that's available to buy. Maybe that has something to do with it. I'm just musing here as we're, (laughs) as we're talking about it probably for the second or third time. But I think, I think that's, what's really interesting is we have money to spend. And hopefully we're buying things at cheaper prices because that, that would help inflation in a big way. Yeah, I know the sales were pretty good this year. I, I, I can't speak to if they were better than prior years or not. As you mentioned, it's often different products that go on sale. Um, but I do know that some of the stores that tend to market towards more bargain or, or lower prices really spiked on Friday, on Black Friday, uh, Walmart received a significant number of increased search results online. Um, and then the other company that's been seeing a ton of traction really throughout this whole year is Grocery Outlet. And uh, Grocery Outlet has an interesting business model where they buy products in bulk that are mm. close to expiring. Um, and so th- they, they can sell those at a discounted price. And by the way, I don't know the definition of close to expiring. I don't know if that means next week or, or in six months or something. <laughs> like really um, close to sour milk. Yeah. Not close so to sour. sour milk. Yeah. <laughs> Buy it and drink it all today. Yeah. But that business model is interesting because they're buying products at a, at a discount from other places that, you know, they need to clear their shelves and then they pass that along to their, yeah. to their customers. And so stores like that are gaining a significant amount of sales because they're selling the presumably the same products at lower prices right now. Um, so anyway, kind of interesting stuff going on. Well, we talked about it. I want to say in the summer when we were talking about the bull whip effect and remember mm-hmm. we we're going down the list of companies that had so much inventory and which ones we thought we were going to be in trouble or not. I think it's playing out. Because I've actually started seeing quite a bit of a, like Yeti, remember them? Mm-hmm. Um, I argue that they wanted to keep their exclusivity high, meaning they wanted to be known as like a premium high brand. brand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing, I saw quite a bit of a customized Yeti, Yeti mugs, Yeti coolers go on, go on sale too. More, more of the mugs. So, you know, the insulated mugs that everyone yeah. loves. Um, I think that's been a bigger issue with some of the retailers where uh, they've drew down some of the inventory, but year over year, it's, it's significantly higher, mm-hmm. right? I brought my kids to Best Buy post Black Friday and the, the store was still fully stocked. So maybe either people mm-hmm. are shifting towards online or it, it must be right based on the retail numbers. Cause if Amazon and Walmart sold that much online, why are the physical stores still stocked? It's an interesting point, Maybe right? Overseas, if sales yeah. were higher than they were in the prior year by a good margin, but maybe we have a lot more stuff this year. It just, you know, you didn't notice the dent. Whereas last year we had fewer items because of all the supply chain, cr- supply chain crunches and those sorts of things. And so maybe the shelves were just simply less full Yeah, last year. 
Yeah, and that could be a result of such a low baseline last year because mm-hmm. availability just simply was. If I wanted to buy a washer dryer last year, I had to wait months. Okay. And now if I wanted to buy one now, I'm going to pay for it in the moment and get it delivered in two days. That counts as a transaction today. Mm-hmm. So that that works out for the buyer and the seller here. So I think things are definitely improving in the, the supply chain, if not already improved to a point where it might be too much. And I think that that was an issue we've dealt with since the summer. You know, and we're just looking this up, this is related, uh, LA port data. Everybody remembers hearing that in the news, how the number of ships backlogged in the LA port and they were rerouting yeah. them elsewhere. Uh, we were trying to find this a minute ago, but I, I think the number was over a hundred uh, ships that were that were essentially just not getting unloaded. Uh, you can Google this now, and we looked it up, and there are currently, as of today, 11 ships in the harbor. Yeah. So that's good. That's good news. Yeah, well, we went from too many ships waiting to be processed to too much of those those containers taking up too much space because there was nowhere to place them. Too much and stuff. Now, mm-hmm. now there's too much stuff on the shelves in our homes mm-hmm. probably too, but the shelves of the retail stores. So, so that's the bulb effect that we're living, right? Because all that demand that we built up in 2021, we're seeing it now in the form of like some pretty hefty Black Friday deals. So you had some interesting data here on items that had larger discounts year over year, and then also uh, stores, stores that seem to have year over year inventory clear out. So maybe speak to that for a minute. Yeah, computers relative to the last year, the the amount of discounts compared to 2021, um, there's 32% of computers in inventory that was discounted. It was only 10% last year. So it shows you how (laughs) steep that that difference is, the delta, the 22% difference, right? You look at electronics, you look at the number of TVs that I saw dotted in the, the walkway of Best Buy. I don't know if you've been into a Best Buy, but it's like a big square. Yeah, they fill they fill the walkways with TVs, and there were still plenty of TVs that Sunday. Like they they haven't moved. Um, clothing we mentioned, right? Uh, Target and Walmart just have an overabundance of clothes, appliances, sporting goods, all these things that I don't know if you you don't have to think hard, but all these things were really popular and really in high demand in during the pandemic. What I'm seeing here is that everything in 2022 has higher discounts than in 2021. Makes sense. Uh, you know, less supply chain shortages and whatnot. The only thing that is close, toys. Toys, maximum discount, according to this chart here, 2022 is 22%. 2021 was 19%. But everything else is, you know, electronics went from 8% in 2021 discounts yeah. to 27%, which I guess speaks to the chip shortage potentially catching back up, uh, meaning maybe we don't have as much of a shortage today as we once did. Yeah, in terms of, uh, I guess, the consumer electronics, but we're still experiencing quite a bit of a chip shortage in cars, mm. which is probably another big component of of inflation you know, relative to a TV. Like if you bought a, a new car and I bought a new TV, your car is just simply going to carry more weight simply because it's a bigger ticket item. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. And then, yeah, the next part of your question was who's who's sitting on the most inventory? Believe yeah. it or not, Macy's apparel was a big, big discounted item, but Macy held up pretty, pretty well. Um, so I don't know what their inventory management has been like, or if they've kind of found a TG Maxx or uh, with our version of Grocery Outlet, where, where they're sending extra clothes to that discounter uh, more effectively. But yeah, everyone's kind of back out and about, and all the the new fashion resets, all the, you know, get rid of the pajamas and start wearing pants again. (laughs) I think that's pretty much uh, said. You don't need to keep updating your wardrobe. But we're seeing, you know, large inventory builds in Kohl's, which does both clothing and and appliances and everything else. But Gap, it shows it shows Gap might be pretty, pretty badly mismanaged in terms of how much clothes they, they, they've had to get rid of or produced. Um, 
in Walmart. Walmart, I think, has done a more admirable job, but still they're struggling. So it shows you how difficult this, this really the 2021 last landscape has been to deal with. And I think we're still dealing with it. So just so that I understand here, I'm, I'm in for our listeners who can't see this chart that you and I are staring at. So let's take Walmart, for example. So uh, this is saying Q1 spread between year on year sales and inventory growth. Q1 is minus 30% on Walmart. So does that mean that Walmart accumulated 30% more stuff, meaning they sold less than they accumulated. So that's why that's a minus 30%. That's that correct. That yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you want that close in terms of, um, you, Toyota's just in time. You want that number closer to zero. Cause you don't want to sit on inventory, especially if your job is to sell, <laughs> sell yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, the bigger that, that negative number is the worse off that your sales have been because you're, you're paying for storage space. You're paying for loss prevention. Uh, you're paying for um, cleaning it. You're paying for stocking it and moving mm -hmm. it uh, about the store. So all those costs that that build up from your inventory build up that really has a downward effect on retail stores. I'd, I'd love to see this chart updated in Q4. So this would be an interesting one if we can take a note and revisit this. Uh, I wonder if all these big sales corrected this. The most extreme chart on here for our listeners is Kohl's. So Kohl's uh, minus 45% Q1. So that means they have 45% more inventory than they did. Yeah. Their sales didn't match their inventory. Minus 56% in Q2, minus 41% in Q3, meaning they have a ton of stuff that they can't sell. <laughs> yeah. And I, I didn't really do any scientific research over the weekend about Black Friday sales, but Kohl's was all over the place in terms of advertising on social media and steep discounts on, on aggregate sites. <laughs> Interesting. Well, uh, like I said, I'm excited to see Q4 <laughs> numbers to see if they can, and, and Macy's the surprise. Minus four, minus eight, minus eight, Q1, Q2, Q3 for our listeners. So yeah, they're, they're doing something pretty cool. They partnered with uh, whoever owns Toys R Us and they started, you know, earmarking space on, on their big floors for, uh, like a mini Toys R Us inside the Macy's. Yeah. Yeah. So we think Macy's is going to make it. I don't know. They seem to be well managed through this, this one of the toughest environments I've seen for retail. Wow. Like Target Target's probably one of the worst hit. Um, because they, they cater to that upper middle, I guess. And mm -hmm. I think that that class of, you know, population has done, has probably felt most of the inflation hit. Because they just also, spend, Sorry, go ahead. No, because they spend more, right, of their relative to other groups. There's also something interesting there, and I'm racking my brain, uh, Target, I think it was Target that only has about 20% of their sales in grocery versus Walmart is 50% of their sales in groceries yeah. in their stores. And so that can have an impact as well. And I might have those flipped, but based on their sales mix, they, they, you know, food inflation has been a, been a big deal. Uh, so, you know, potentially that would affect uh, say a Walmart more if 50% of Walmart's in-store sales comes from grocery versus targets only 20. Yeah, you're right. Cause essential purchasing has been prioritized here. And I think yeah. that's how Walmart's been able to sustain some of the, some of the inventory traps that we, mm -hmm. we saw target fall into the last quarter. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, just something interesting that I was reading today. So Goldman Sachs came out. And the headline here is the exceptionalism of technology is probably over for the stock market. So in reading this article, they're saying, you know, for the last much of the last decade, you've had big tech that's dominated the markets and they're kind of going into why, and it's you know, low interest rates and high growth rates and this, and that, and the other. Yeah. Now the market's not giving those stocks as much of a premium as everybody knows, there's been a pretty big tech sell off. And the chart here that struck me is a chart that goes all the way back to 1990. 
And this chart shows two lines, the four largest stocks in 2000, and that was Microsoft, Cisco, GE, and Intel. And it shows that the weight in the S&P 500 for those four stocks peaked in 2000 at 16%. And then uh, now today, those four stocks are equivalent of about 6% of the S&P 500. And Microsoft is probably accounting 5.8, 6%. That's a good point, actually. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's good what, point. That highlights why stock picking, like individual stock picking is so hard. Well, but 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 hold on. Let me let me go to yeah. the, the second component here. And, and then I want to talk about this. So uh, in today's world, it was Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google. And previous to this recent sell-off, they reached a market high of 22% of the S&P 500. So you've got four stocks that are 22% and uh, 496 yeah. that is everything else, which is wild. Now, in 1994, those four stocks were kind of nothing. You know, I'm just I'm looking at these two charts that crossed a line in 2010. And, uh, and the point of this is that if you happen to own one of these stocks that is, is, or was a market leader, I think the lesson here is that generally that market leader today isn't always market dominant forever. Yeah. And I think the index performance is really driven by the future market leaders. So I think that goes into the question of who's going to replace Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, and when. Um, that, that could be decades away. That could be a year away. Because mm -hmm. if you think about the next year, what would really push these behemoths off? Because you think about what Google does is they see an up-and-comer, they'll probably buy it. Think about YouTube. Right. YouTube alone might have still known as a top five valuable company in, mm -hmm. in today's market. And Pe people said the same about AWS. Yeah. Yeah. And if AWS ever spins off, that could be, you know, a top two or three company on its own. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is we don't know. And I know Goldman is you know, like a lot of pundits stick their neck out and say something so bold, they could be wrong. And, mm -hmm. but more history is on their side though. They're right. They could be right. And I think uh, I mentioned, uh, um, stadium naming rights and in, in Seattle, I, I forgot what the, the Seahawks play in, but I remember it was century link for the longest time, but yeah. Lumen, Lumen field. Lumen, now. Yeah. Is, is that name going to last? And again, no offense to Lumen or its employees. It's just, that's the way it goes. Like in LA, we have what, Stable Center and whatever it is now, crypto, crypto.com arena. So I think that holds the record for the shortest, you know, viable sponsorship. Yeah. yeah. If you just look at company success and use that as a correlation to, you know, naming rights. Stadiums all across the world are being changed just simply because the businesses funding those sponsorships no longer exist. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a natural progression of things. And yeah, as I said before, it just makes it hard to pick a single stock and stick with it relative to an index because what does the index do? It kicks out losers and adds to the winners, right? You've heard it here before, you'll hear it again. When you own the index, you sort of automatically do that rebalancing behind the scenes. And if one company, you know, if, if Walmart takes business from Target and that market capitalization is sort of excreted from Target to Walmart, that's automatically shown up in your yeah. S&P 500 index fund. And that's awesome. Uh, in fact, I wish that they plotted from 1990 to today, the S&P 500, because you see this really just simple line that we're trying to achieve, right? So uh, I think the, the, the moral of the story is you know, if you happen to, to have a lot of a market leading stock, it may not be a market leader forever. Uh, and so try to look at it objectively. If you happen to own something that's beat the market over the last number of years, maybe it's a good time to take those profits and reinvest into the market because you have a higher probability of going the right direction for a longer period of time. Yeah, and I, I wrote about this story where I met um, an XGE engineer, 
And mm-hmm. he worked through GE's Jack Welsh heydays. And co- turns out Jack Welsh wasn't the most honest in terms of accounting for GE. So they're dealing with the reverberations now. But his his entire future was tied to GE stock. Yeah. What has that done since 2000? And you really can't put your eggs in that basket, even if it is one of the best companies in the world. Mm-hmm. It's just way too much risk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think similar to, you know, right now when it's, it's, we look at a lot of these market leading companies and it's like, how would they ever not be market leaders? That's the same feeling that, uh, you know, everyone had in the two thousands is how would this company not be a market leader in the future? And this is not a, it's, it's not a negative statement. It's just a, we have facts to back up the reality of what often happens in over time. Yeah. I'm going to take you back to my childhood and the the nineties when AOL instant messenger was the mm-hmm. king and so Netscape was the king. Yeah. <laughs> and in Netscape and AOL and Yahoo and this up and comer Google, no one, no one saw that and said, Google's going to displace these entrenched because Netscape came on the computer. Like you, you installed windows and Netscape was on there or windows Explorer was on. I there. remember. And yeah. Google. Google knocked them both off with mm-hmm. Chrome and with um, Firefox. So Firefox came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. You can't, you can't predict it. I think um, if you're looking for a lottery ticket, scale it, scale it down, right? And we're we're just we're dealing with the uh, the ripple effects of a crypto blow up. And again, I we never recommended crypto, but um, if it was scaled properly, let's say no more than five percent, and you lost all of it you can still recover from that because you still have 95% of your assets. That's really the point here. Everything, everything works when you tie it around a financial plan. Can I take this risk? Yes. No. If yes, is that risk asymmetric to my plan? And do I want to, do I want to take it? It's it's, and and those types of things are okay. Yeah. But, um, but it's all has to be tied around the plan to make sure that taking that risk doesn't materially derail what otherwise is important to you. Yeah. And forget about, especially around the holidays when you had a niece or nephew who made gobs of money on crypto last year and rub it in your face because your financial advisor only did X, you know, there, you got to get out of the FOMO, like the fear of missing out mentality. Who cares what anyone else is making? They're taking, especially if they're doing extremely well, they're taking outsized risk and it's not sustainable over the long term because that attracts mm-hmm. other investors and that kind of get whittles down because more competition comes in. Yeah. Well, and, and hopefully that, you know, the, the, there's so much technology behind crypto and, and all of the blockchain behind it. And all of that is, is coming into the banks and whatnot. And there's a lot of good that, that yeah. I think should, and will come out of this. And, and, you know, hopefully that it, it does become uh, a sustainable asset over time. Uh, and, and hopefully the big volatility is maybe gone. Um, Hopefully that's true for the whole market, but just specifically yeah. speaking <laughs> crypto, you know, if, if this does become a piece of, of people's portfolios, hopefully it doesn't go from 15,000 or 16,000 or wherever Bitcoin is today, for example, right back to 30 in a, in a, in a week or a month, it, maybe it does do that, but maybe it does it more normally over time. I don't know. That's not a prediction, but just hopefully we don't see these huge gyrations in the price. Yeah. I think that will actually help, uh, gain more popularity and, and, and usability if it's not so volatile. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see, you know, that's another one that we can't really predict. All right. On to the main event. So the topic that we wanted to talk about today was capital gains distributions from mutual funds. There's a, a host of things that, that go into this. So, uh, you know, demystifying mutual fund investing, you know, what do these ticker symbols mean? So, capital gains cost do mutual funds actually beat their benchmarks so uh how i'm gonna hand it over to you to 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 start and um yeah go ahead and kick us off yeah yeah well this came up because this is um this podcast was really created to kind of pull back the curtain on what we do behind the scenes and show how really the client base um how active we are just trying to be best, the best stewards of their money we possibly can. Um, we do have mutual fund investments in our in our accounts. 
Um, and I know a lot of personal finance gurus out there say buy an index, right? And just let it grow passively, which for um, a lot of people, it makes sense. And for us, it makes sense because we, we know mutual funds cannot beat their U.S. benchmarks, especially if they're in the large cap variety and they're competing against the S&P 500. But yeah, what's the stat there? It's something like 80% of fund managers can't beat the S&P. Some, yeah. And, and yeah. The, the 20% that do don't do it every year. So it's always changing. So it's like, we're big believers in index funds. We, we generally index the U S markets. Yeah, it's the best the majority, way maybe. Yeah. The majority of our U S assets are in passive index ETFs and index funds. Um, yeah, you're right. The, the majority of active managers do not beat their benchmarks in the U S and that's because they are the market. Imagine me and you running our own respective funds and we have a research team and we're competing against each other. That's a zero sum game. And yeah, it makes sense to passively stand by and let those guys duke it out. Mm -hmm. But that's an important feature of the market because that's called price discovery. Meaning if I'm selling Krista uh, a share of Google, right? And he's buying for me, there's two transactions, me selling, because I don't think it's going up any further, him buying because he thinks it's, it has more room, right? So one of us is going to be right or wrong. That's called price discovery. We're both doing very smart research. We're doing performing the best of our ability, but it's highly competitive because it's zero sum, meaning mm -hmm. someone's going to win, at least in the short term, and someone's going to lose. If mm -hmm. I take the proceeds of that sale and invest it in, let's say, Microsoft, how much am I really losing? Because that's that's the dynamic of the market, and that's that's where traders, right, which you know, are run by pension funds, insurance companies, and also, also mutual fund managers, they they push the markets around based on the information that they have, right? And that's, that's where we kind of get that efficient market theory over the long term, meaning the market's going to process all the available information it has on hand now, the publicly available information. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an important feature of mutual fund managers, but not, by no means are we uh, wholeheartedly defending mutual fund managers because, yeah, they do have a history of overcharging clients since really since mutual funds started, right? And so, are are there areas yeah, of the market where a mutual fund would be more? I mean, I guess really what we're comparing is active management versus passive. And we can go down that rabbit hole here in a second too, yeah. but are there areas of the market that in research or statistics would say, Hey, this area tends to be a little bit more favorable towards a stock picker or an active manager of mutual fund of sorts versus this area of the market, as we talked about is like us large cap and a lot of us holdings that tends to favor, just go passive, go ETF. That's the best way to go. What, what have you found or what do you know yeah. about that? Yeah, let's let's dig into your top, what was it, six or seven companies making up 22% of the S&P. Mm -hmm. What am I going to tell you about Apple that you already don't know and vice versa? So all the information available about Apple and its trouble with iPhone production in China, that's, that's historic information already. Are you going to trade on that information? Who are you going to beat? Mm -hmm. right? Apple and... Microsoft and all the big mega cap companies, they have 70 plus analysts from all these different shops around the world um, putting out price targets. Are we all, are we smarter than those guys who, you know, are of the Goldman Sachs pedigree? I probably wouldn't think so. And so can I beat them on a trade? Most likely not. They're probably playing a different game too. But yes, <clears throat> generally... See you're, you're saying you're saying because of that that access to that information uh it's very hard to beat us large cap companies uh or very hard to beat the s p when you are an active manager yeah uh, because that information is more or less publicly shown and these companies as we just highlighted a, a minute ago the top companies are the top companies until they aren't and there's not much we can do to try to beat that Unless we get lucky <laughs> exactly. and overweight the right one of them. 
Yeah, imagine trying to beat the S and P 500 without Apple in the last 10 years. Right. 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 And we're trying to beat it without Microsoft or Google. That that's a very very tough task. And to that end, imagine trying to ride, say, Meta right at its top yeah. and then sell it perf at perfect timing. Like no one does that, right? Like, mutual fund managers don't do that. And I think to your point, it doesn't matter how smart this person is; it's next to impossible to call the top and say, "Hey, I'm going to make an active weight against the S and P, and I'm going to sell my." meta yeah. holding and go underweight and go overweight, you know, visa, because visa is actually positive on the year <laughs> said no mutual fund manager ever. So I think your point is, it's just impossible to, to, to do that in a, in a, in a consistent way to achieve good results or better than average results than yeah. just buying the index. Yeah. And to really get to address your first question about, is it possible to be? Yes. But there's a lot of um, parameters that have to line up for mm -hmm. that to, to be the case, where you're, the likelihood of you beating the S&P 500, if that's the sandbox you're playing in, pretty slim, because you're competing against some other big, big players. Um, so we, we automatically check off us large cap as a beatable marketplace it's there's just so mm -hmm. much information so many players in there that you're not going to gain an edge because you're essentially having to beat millions of people but, so go ahead yeah but you can if you have a relative active share meaning you're not playing by the index rules which again investors don't have to play by the index rules and if you have the S&P 500 and you're an investor or you're a trader or you're, you're a fund manager, well, what if you own 20, 25 shares, 50 shares that you really like mm -hmm. or 50 stocks, not 50 shares. <laughs> You'd be very poor fund manager, but that's that divergence from the 505 stocks in the S&P 500, the, the bigger the difference, the higher what we call active share meaning you need to depart enough from the index to have a chance to beat the index. So let me explain back to you to make sure that I, I heard you correctly. So active share when measuring a mutual fund, uh, active share is a higher number of active share means that that fund manager is holding holdings that are relatively different than the benchmark yeah. that they are trying to to beat a low active share means that they are essentially trying to hug that index or we call that closet indexing. And a lot of mutual funds, by the way, do this. It's a lot of mutual funds charge their fee and they perform exactly the same as the index fund. Less that, the fee though. Significantly like, yeah. less. Yeah. 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 And, and so we don't want to buy a mutual fund that is a closet, closet index fund. So high active share is meaningfully different than the index. Yes. And closet index funds, Really, it's hard to identify what it is mm -hmm. um, without some of the tools we use internally. Um, that, <clears throat> yeah, you're, you're essentially paying for index performance without the, any any chance of outperformance. Um, yeah. Closet indexing has been more of a survival tactic for a lot of these funds as they grew and grew and grew. Because uh, the example I mentioned where, let's say I just want to own 50 to 100 names and I want to manage that pool of money. Mm -hmm. And I do reasonably well for one, two, three, four years. And that starts attracting attention. Mm -hmm. it starts attracting more and more money. And all of a sudden I have to put an extra few billion dollars to work, for example. Mm -hmm. That's a lot harder to do than 100 million, 200 million. Because you can buy a significant amount of your stocks without getting into ownership territory, mm -hmm. right? And I think Kathy Wood ran into this problem where in a lot of cases she was the only buyer, right? So uh, ARKK's previous success is probably the biggest reason for their downfall is they were able to concentrate and buy a finite amount of stocks and be, be world beaters, right? 2020 was one of the, probably the best years in any fund manager's um, arsenal. Yeah. But then all this money came in. Yeah. 
And by taking all this money and not closing, in their case, we're going to get into this like an ETF. We'll mm-hmm. probably get into another episode, but um, they can't control the the flow of money in and out. Mm-hmm. And that makes it very difficult for a fund manager to keep up with their their thesis. And that's that's one of the big drawbacks of active investing. So let me add some color there. So what we find is that uh, fund mutual funds that are top performers, they tend to be smaller funds and smaller is by size. So these aren't the you know $250 billion funds because how, to your point, the $250 billion fund has to go buy a lot of these index holdings. They have to buy Johnson & Johnson. They yeah. have to buy Apple because they have to do something with the money and they can't simply execute their strategy with that large of a fund. So if they're a $10 million fund, a $20 million fund, a 50, hundred, couple hundred million dollar fund, they can execute their strategy. The problem or the, the curse of success is that when you're doing really well as a mutual fund manager, flows come to you. Flows come to you in the form of, if you're in a 401k plan, or if you're uh, in, you know, even just retail accounts buying your fund. And the problem with that is your fund can go from 200 million to 25 billion in a very quick period of time. And now the fund manager is struggling to continue to execute their strategy. The second component of that is that what we find is that uh, mutual funds that tend to perform better are sort of the, the other asset classes. So as we said, not large cap US, but small cap US, international, real estate, bonds. These are kind of the areas that tend to do a little bit better in this space. And again, as they get too big, they they struggle to, to perform. You'll see mutual funds close. Uh, closing means we're not taking new money. Which we welcome, yeah. Which we welcome, yeah. And many of the, the best funds, if you Google, what are the top performing mutual funds? You almost you won't be able them. to find yeah. an open one. Can't get yeah. them. Because the fund managers close them because they want to preserve their their strategy for their current investors to to do right by their their current investors, so it's sort of the the uh, curse actually of of the ETF world is that ETFs don't close, and they're always open for new money, and they can um, therefore not be small and different than an index. They have to essentially always be an index. Yep. Yep. So uh, Chris kind of touched on it too, where we do believe in mutual funds, but it's very specific asset classes. And by asset mm-hmm. class, I mean small cap funds, international mm-hmm. funds, emerging market funds, um, these these that aren't so highly traded. Or, you know, if you're a big fund, you, you probably can't really play in the small cap sandbox, mm-hmm. especially if you're running billions and billions of dollars, because you're simply going to own the entire group of companies. Company. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's, that's, as we saw, um, in 2020, that's pretty dangerous. If you have a high concentration in your fund and, or if you're the only buyer in a lot of cases and you're driving up its own stock price. Um, so yeah, we, we think there's, there's opportunities in the lesser known areas, but it creates a challenge because you got to keep monitoring these active managers, right? Yeah. Are they going to do what they say they're going to do? How did they justify their fee? Yeah. Um, and as we started this segment, they don't. A majority of them don't. Mm-hmm. That's why you got to have rigorous screening process, rigorous monitoring process, because you are entrusting, um, you know, your money with them, but also the expenses. Mm-hmm. Because active mutual funds tend to have a higher cost. More cost, yeah. right? And again, you, you might be listening to this. Well, all I do is index. Check your 401ks. I've, <laughs> Chris knows this. I look at lots of company 401ks, lots and lots of 401ks. You wouldn't believe how many active mutual fund managers are in there mm-hmm. and how many of those don't even pass our screens. So well, Many of them, too, in up markets take more risk. Because uh, they're trying to beat their index, right? So they they do it by taking more risk, which looks great in up markets, and, and then in down markets looks terrible. And so it's it's the the screening process has to be done over multiple market periods and multiple stress tests to figure out is this fund manager actually doing better on the upside, but also controlling risk on the downside, which is very hard to do, by the way. Yeah. But even harder to do once you have success 
because you have more stocks. And, and, you know, one of the things that we look for is fewer holdings in the fund. You know, if it's 50 holdings or 150 holdings or that type of thing, that generally contributes to a higher active share, which is something that we tend to like in mutual yes. fund positions versus that fund that has 350 holdings or 500 holdings. That's just an index fund. And that fund doesn't have any chance of controlling risk different than say just a, a an index fund can. Exactly. And I think uh, the small cap sandbox is something that we struggle to find an open manager, um, meaning open, mm -hmm. meaning they're accepting money mm -hmm. um, because the, the best ones will set a low ceiling and that's it. And mm -hmm. it's new investors cannot jump in. And I think, I think that's actually pretty responsible, but again, it proves that there are managers out there that can beat their index but it's just a matter of accessing them. And it does create a lot more legwork than a relative uh, index, a passive index or ETF, because you can ensure that your passive index is gonna rebalance with the index, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's drawbacks to active management, but as long as you have the tools and I guess the experience and know-how to kind of keep on top of it, I think there's a quite a big quite a bit of a benefit to, to jumping into active managers in specific asset classes in the right areas. Yeah. Use in the right correctly. areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about capital gains distribution. So something that's very unique with the mutual fund structure is they have a tendency to pay capital gains. Uh, ETFs don't do this, uh, at least don't often do this. Yeah. So let's talk about what is a capital gain, uh, how, how do these funds do this? When do they pay it? I know we're looking at this a lot right now, so I'm leading you here. Um, and and what are some strategies around capital gains? What should our clients be thinking about? Yeah, first off, this this will impact both qualified and non-qualified accounts and in your 401k. So um, a capital gains distribution is if a fund manager has done well in the past and started selling some of the winners, the fund participants are on the hook for capital gains, meaning Makes even sense. if they're new investors, right? That's that's kind of the, the big drawback or disadvantage of mutual fund investing is um, past impacts, past trades will impact you in today's market. So, so, so and the reason why that's important is that capital gains distributions are paid once a year. Yeah. So let's say that you bought Around XYZ fund yeah. today at this time yeah. of year. Yeah. Let's say you bought the fund today you're likely to get a capital gains distribution here in the next couple of weeks before the end of the year for all year. So yeah. it's horribly tax inefficient to you if you own the thing for a week, but you're paying taxes on it like you've owned it all year. Yeah, and so the, that's one of the, being able to monitor, keep being able to screen for this stuff is, it takes quite a bit of uh, constant know-how and constant work. And my team does, always checks for the con the, the capital gains distribution. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned it affects retirement accounts and non-retirement. Mm -hmm. So non-retirement kind of, it makes sense, right? Like I got a 10% distribution capital gain. That's mm -hmm. tax debt. You know, that's taxed. Mm -hmm. So I can avoid that by selling the fund and then getting back into it after the distribution kicks out. But that's mm -hmm. quite a bit of trading. What what fund do you replace it with? Do you sit on cash? Do you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, the, all these extra active decisions are thrown into the mix. For our uh, retirement accounts, this includes 401ks. I, mean, I mentioned that we have active, I've seen quite a few active funds in 401ks. If you want to be 100% invested, that 10% comes back as cash. So now you got to go back in and rebalance your 401k and get that money put back to work. So that's, that's why I said it affects both sides, more so the, the non-retirement um, non accounts, the taxable accounts, but there's quite a bit of um, year-end work that that investors have to do on their active mutual funds. So I think in 401ks, it's a, a, the note there is just make sure that you're set to reinvest capital gains distributions. Yeah. Um, sometimes that's the default. Yeah. Sometimes in they're dividends, yeah, set yeah. to be 
paid to cash and then you're going to have extra cash in your in your 401k which we often find when, we, when we're looking at 401ks yeah. there's yeah. where's this three thousand dollars in cash coming from that's not doing any good and it's i don't know where that came from let's invest it might be because capital gains were set to pay to cash not reinvest in the fund and they should just default to always reinvest in the fund yeah um, yeah and the next i guess natural question would be why are funds paying any kind of gains in a year that we're down 16 17 percent mm, yeah and that's because that. The, the mutual fund structure, you're at the will of other investors. So let's say mm -hmm. me, Chris, are in a pool with other investors, mm -hmm. and they start pulling money out because they start panicking. That fund manager is forced to sell and probably sell things he likes. So we mentioned that getting too much money is a bit of a curse, but having too much money leave your fund is also a curse. Mm -hmm. And I think that forces fund managers to sell things that they like just to answer those liquidation requests. Mm -hmm. And we liquidate enough, like some of these bigger funds, you have to start paying, selling some winners and start mm -hmm. paying some of these capital gains taxes on for, for anyone else is left holding the bag. So, so that's something you have to watch for with mutual funds in a non retirement account in a redemption year. Yeah. In a redemption year. Especially, yeah. it's a double hit in a year like this too. Because why would any fund manager, you know, lock in gains and hit hit their investors with the tax? That that's really the that's the biggest reason why. So, and this is interesting. Capital gains are, are different than dividends. So, just so that we're clear, dividends are the underlying holdings inside of your mutual funds. Yeah. Those stocks that pay a dividend, those are packaged up and sent out to you as the investor. Nowhere to avoid that. That's true for an ETF or a mutual fund. Capital gains is something that's a little bit more unique to mutual funds is, you know, how you're pointing out money comes into the fund, money goes out of the fund that forces sales or forces buys at maybe inopportune times. Or it could be the fund manager saying, I'm going to make a pivot in the fund. And that then generates these capital gains distributions. And in some, this is a taxable event. Most of the time, capital gains are taxed at long-term capital gains rates. We actually get breakdowns of reports and it might say yeah. XYZ fund is paying a 7% capital gains distribution and uh, you know, six of that 7% is long-term and one of that 1% of that is short-term. So most of the time it's long-term, which simply means that the things that they're selling, they're owning for over a year, but not always. So taxable events uh, in these range, um, we have reports, I believe the average is about 6% is the average capital gains distribution. Do I have that right? It's yeah. about average. So our, our, the high end on our list is about 8%. And I've seen mm -hmm. years in 2018 uh, as high as 23%. So let's, let's play that math out, right? Let's say you have $100,000 in that fund that pays out a 23% capital gains distribution you're going to get a $23,000 taxable event. And, you and your money it. didn't move anywhere. Yeah. It, you didn't sell. Yeah, yeah. You didn't sell. It was just stuff that was sold uh, behind the scenes in, mm -hmm. in this, you know, rebalance or this, these flows or whatever, whatever happened within the fund. Now, what's the positive? What's the good news? That $23,000 distribution, you will pay tax on it, but it adds to your cost basis. And uh, what's important to understand here is that you're not going to be taxed twice on this. So, let's keep this math uh, simple here. So let's say you paid a hundred thousand dollars for the fund and you had a $23,000 capital gain, just came $23,000 yeah. capital gains distribution. It is now like you paid $123,000 for the fund. So if you turned around right. and you sold it for 125,000, you would only owe an additional $2,000 of taxable gains. So I just want to be clear that when you go to sell the fund, again, in my example for 125,000, you're not paying tax on, 25,000 of gain plus the 23,000 yeah. of capital, uh, capital gains distributions. Yeah. And people on top, that's what makes mutual funds so relatively inefficient to indexes because indexes will sometimes pay a capital gains distribution, meaning yeah. if they kick a name out and let's say it, it was a winner to a relative few, that's still a small, very small because indexes are very widely held, right? Like lots of names in them, mm -hmm. but yeah, that, the nimble investors can actually use that to a benefit because you're spreading out your tax liability, you know, really through no choice of your own, but it's taken some of the taxes this, this year. And yeah. then now you have 
a big potential benefit for future years. So it's not the end of the world. It's just something you got to be aware of. Yeah. I think a benefit of this is that mutual funds, they cost you a little bit of tax each year versus if you have an ETF that isn't paying a capital gains distribution, which is most of them, you're likely to have this very large gain at the end when you need to go sell it. And so that can be more painful. And I think something that's also important to understand here is that when you're looking at your statement, you oftentimes see an ETF, say it's an S&P 500 ETF that you've owned for the last decade, and it's significantly up. Uh, If you compare that to uh, a mutual fund that you've owned also for the last decade, you might not have as much of a gain on, say, your statement. Most statements from custodians only show what's called cumulative return, literally what I bought it for and what it is now. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't, the, the dividends that are adding to it are, are um, adding to that cost basis and you know, the dividends and, and the capital gains. And so again, it's just recognized differently in mutual funds. You need actual tools that'll say, what was my rate of return on this fund over that decade to appropriately compare you know, the fund versus whatever else. So there, there's a layer there that's a little bit more complicated, but I think the crux of it is capital gains distributions are taxable but it's not the end of the world because it does add to your, your, uh, cost basis, which means you'll pay less tax when you sell in the future. Yeah. And going back two shows ago, that gives you an opportunity to rebalance because you are, you know, taking an indirect tax hit anyway. Mm -hmm. I know taxes Mm -hmm. are super sensitive to people, but you know, I, I ran into this issue in early 2020, specifically Mm -hmm. February. We told uh, a big pool of clients to rebalance but they had taxes built up from 20, 2019 and everyone mm-hmm. was hesitant to reduce risk. Mm-hmm. That's again, you give it back to the market or you give it to uncle Sam, you have to weigh, you have to be able to weigh that objectively without emotion. You totally get it's charged up when someone else is, feels like it's taking your profits cause they are, it's a, it's a tax, but I'd rather deal with, do that than have what the, the market was down. 40% in 2020. I should know this, but like it was down more than any tax rate that I've heard of. It's true. Yeah. You're right. It's a good point. Yeah. All right. Well, next time we're going to cover ETFs. So ETF structure, why is it more tax efficient? And also know what you own. This is a conversation that how and I've talked about many times, but the, the title of a fund isn't always, uh, what's in it. Um, it's, it can be a, a sales tool, right? What do you name yeah. a fund to try to garner interest? And so we thought we would talk about that a little bit to, to educate our listeners on what to look for there. Um, oh, and capital gains distributions. If you're seeing a bunch of trading in your account now, if you are listening in your current client of ours, it's because if we're trading in that fund, it's because we're trying to avoid that capital gains distribution. So um, we look at it and we see if there's a distribution, we see what that's gonna be taxable wise to you. And we determine, should we hold that and have those taxes be paid, have the distribution yep. paid, or should we sell the fund, avoid it, and then go buy back? So that's kind of what how you're talking about is, is this time of year is a lot of trading and analysis work to see what should we do uh, based on as we get capital gains information in. Yeah, and I think the point of the episode, I know we've we've really touched on the, the disadvantages of mutual funds. There There is a benefit, but with that, you need to keep an eye on your investments. Yeah. Right, and that's, that's our full-time job. So yes, that's fine. But if you're listening to this and you're not a client of ours and you're going to go out and jump on a mutual fund, I just don't. One, how do you screen for that? And two, how do you monitor it ongoing? By right. it is just yeah just uh, i yeah. do recommend indexing for um the majority of people especially if they're using this podcast as advice which again <laughs> i think we have a disclosure not advice but um mine is to keep it simple as much as yeah. possible yeah which we do as well most of our holdings are, are etf yeah. holdings and index fund holdings as well and and we'll talk more about the tax efficiency of that and and how etfs work on yeah. our next episode Yeah. Great conversation. Yeah, this is fun. All right. Talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone.